Richie, how you doing? We'll go ahead and get started. Oh, yeah, sorry. Good afternoon. This is the Gary Sansing Public Forum uh, for the May 6th meeting. It is uh, 4.33 p.m. Please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, vibrate, silence, or offsetting. The Gary Sansing Public Forum is intended for matters not included on the agenda for the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting. Citizens wishing to address items on the agenda should sign up to speak to such an item at the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the Gary Sansing Public Forum. Each speaker is limited to three minutes unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Uh, as a reminder, we don't have the beeps like we have previously, and so there'll be uh, your name up, will be up here with a countdown, and so please be mindful of that, or I'll ask you just to, to wrap up your comments. Um, the first speaker of the night, uh, Brian Wire. Hi, Brian Ward, 321 North Village Street, Pensacola, Florida, 3501. Uh, I have some handouts for you here that I wanted to give you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank your communications department with the county for sending out the message. This is a press release for Brace, and uh, on Monday we sent a press release out announcing that Brace is now accepting calls for businesses. So Brace has always accepted calls for residential -ish items that were taking place. And a few weeks ago, Brace has agreed to now take calls for businesses that are having problems with Hurricane Sally. Uh, after the press release was sent out on Monday, on Tuesday we received four, 40 additional calls to Brace in an effort to have uh, businesses and some residents have some services taken care of to resolve issues from Hurricane Sally. So here's a press release. I just encourage you to please let all our citizens know. We're going to try to push the word out to everyone we know through, through social media, through um, the media sources to make sure that people know that if they have problems from Hurricane Sally, to please call the brace line so we can keep a track of how many businesses are having problems and also that residents can get issues resolved. The second one was the, was the, uh, was the meeting we have called How to Do Business with Local Government. Uh, Jeff and um, Jeff from the uh, county here, and uh, we have ECUA and also the city involved with this. This is an effort to help make sure we have businesses find the steps and the processes and procedures to do business with the county, the city, and the ECUA. So I just please encourage any businesses you have, please refer them to this webinar so we have ability to get them getting bids and contracts with the government agencies. And that was it. Can I answer any questions for you at all? I have one for you, Brian. Yes. Um, this is a great idea how to do business with the local government. I was just was curious. I don't see the school board on here, and they their budget's like giant. It's like like the city and county combined, and they do a lot of contracting. Are they going to be invited to this as well? Because they're, uh, they're going to be invited to it, and they may attend the call. It's just kind of an open forum that we do currently with the government. What we do, we are planning one for in June with um, Mr. Hall mm -hmm. uh, for all the agencies, and the school board's a very important part of that one. Yeah. Because they, like I say, they put a lot of contracts out to bid for all their schools and facilities. So yeah, and I presented to them at the school school board, and there I think you may have been on, on uh, at school board at the time about having uh, some similar workshops for the school board as well. Thank you, Ms. Appreciate that, Jeff. Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Myers. I'd like to recognize you. Welcome for coming. Thank you for coming. If you want to come on down. Good afternoon, commissioners and everybody else, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, first of all, I want to speak about uh, access to Perdido Key. Uh, as you all may know, I wrote Project Universal Access for the Center for Independent Living. I had done a lot of ADA surveying of Perdido Key and Pensacola Beach. And so I, I know what it's going to take to make both of those beaches accessible for people with disabilities. And the last time I was out there was February the uh, 25th with out of town guest. I went to uh, beach access number one, horrible access. 
not even for people without disabilities. There is, in the middle of the access uh, to the beach, a long concrete boulder that I almost fell on. I took a picture of it. I didn't know who to complain about to get it removed. But it's a hazard. Not, I mean, it's not only is that access not accessible, but it's also a hazard as to people who don't have disabilities. But this is the good news I want to tell you, okay? You have in this community the best resources you could possibly have to help you. You have me, and I'm honestly free. <laughs> and I mean, maybe that makes me not have value, <laughs> you know, because I'm not a high paid consultant and I know y'all have some. But also, you have debug mobility here. I don't know if you know about that company. It's owned by the Demings. Karen Deming is a person who has, she's quadriplegic because of a car accident. She loved going to the beach. So her husband and her started this business about 20 years ago, designing and manufacturing beach wheelchairs. They are sold all over the world, all over the world from Pensacola, Florida. People have access to the beaches. So you have this company right here to help you solve some of these access problems. Even if you build two handicapped parking spaces at access four, you still, four, you, st okay, that's good. Uh, you said you were gonna have 35 parking spaces, right? 31 plus four. 31 plus four, okay, fabulous. But people still have to be able to get to the beach. We're gonna have Moby Mac. Okay, so you're ahead of me on that one, yes, aren't I you? Am. Oh, well, good. Okay, well, huh? <laughs> so anyway, I think that's great, but I just want you to know, we need a lot more access than that. And you have the resources here, and, and me, the Center for Independent Living, Debug Mobility, to do uh, incredible things. So uh, kudos for, Getting that going? Do I have any more time? It, it's showing you're up, but hmm? as, as I said, it's showing your time's up. But I, I would. Uh, well, can I just show it? Show you a picture, real quick. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, I was going to say. I'd be yeah, happy to I give mean, you. in respect to the councilwoman, uh, I, I would give her more time. Uh, if yeah. I, yeah. Well, I, I just want to show you a map, and it's out of date in terms of who represents who on the city. Sherry, can you get in the mic and talk? I can't hear you. you know, I'm, I'm not as old as you, but I can't you hear you. You can't hear me. Are you serious? Yeah, you're talking to the mic. Okay, can you see this? Yes. yes. Can you see the, the yellow and the white between the yellow? That's District 2, okay? And I show you this. Oh, thank you. All of this is the county. This is District 2. Everything that happens here impacts who lives here. And we're all in the county, by the way. This is why graffiti has got to be addressed. And all law enforcement agencies know that. Read it, record it, remove it. Seven days in the city to remove it. Not so in the county. And it's not because you don't have good code enforcement officers. You've got great code enforcement officers, but their hands are tied when it comes to this kind of criminal activity. And that's why I'm asking you to pass an ordinance that mirrors the ordinance the city has, because we're all in this together. And crime knows no boundaries. It's, they're, they're artificial. So I, that's the only other thing I wanted to say. Right. But good job on the beach access, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the finished product. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Myers. Uh, Dr. Horning? Thank you. 
How ironic. Um, uh, <laughs> Gloria Horning, 310 South to Villers, uh, also known as Riverfront. Um, code enforcement. Uh, <laughs> apparently we have the regulations, just nobody's enforcing them. And that is with these builds all over the county. And we go back to Monarch Lane. There is so much, so much illegal discharge off that site that they should be shut down. Don't bring another Wedgwood to this community. This town, I mean this community, is a well-knit community. And now, two entrances, not from a road, again I repeat, a street and a drive. So we've got 18 wheelers, cement trucks, and everything else going through this neighborhood. Of course, hitting the, you know, the public easements, damaging that and adding more water. Y'all need to think about this. You're going to ruin this beautiful little community completely. And let's talk about insurance now. They're going to have to get flood insurance. Betcha. And our lovely governor just upped our home insurance. Affordable housing? How's anybody going to afford a house when they can't afford the insurance? Mine's almost going to double my home insurance. Not my flood, my home insurance. It could price me right out of my house. So we keep building these massive. We don't keep any trees. We don't keep any wetlands. We cut through neighborhoods, endangering children, and the well-being of these people for pursuit of happiness, a constitutional right. And y'all just keep stripping it and stripping it through code, through big build, through zero enforcement. Shut them down until they can come to a better way of being a good steward to that community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warning. Uh, Michelle Tyler. I'm sorry? I just said thank you. Oh. Short people. Hi, my name is Michelle Tyler. I live at 79 Monarch Lane. Um, I, uh, I thank you very much for giving me this platform and this opportunity to come before you as a regular citizen and just plead for my house and my community. Um, I watched the agenda review meeting and my community is a hot topic. And so I went through some of these documents in referral to the clear cutting that they did and the permit they didn't have to do so. And the correspondence back and forth referred to the excuse given by the contractors was that the majority of these trees were felled during Sally. The first page of my appeal is the front of this development post Sally and every tree is still standing. You brought up earlier that the flooding issues had not been thoroughly addressed or brought to the attention that they were prevalent before. I have 10 pages of evidence that was given at our appeal hearing that really documents all the flooding that was present before. And no, there's no presence of swales on Monarch Lane. There hasn't been. There's a tree line in the exact same square footage where a swale would be if there was one there. They aren't present. They weren't present. And so let me ask you, and we'll hold your time. You said that there was evidence of, of, of flooding that was presented before staff uh, at the appeals uh, before. The yes, and I'm order. willing to give. I don't know if you guys. No, well, you can make copies and give it to my office, but that would be disappointing if, if that's true. And so thank you. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's emotional. I'm sorry. Pardon me. I don't typically speak before a board like this. There were no felled trees. That was, a, that was a point. There was prior flooding. That was a point. 
Since November of 2020, residents have continued to report the burning that went on outside of code, clear cutting that went outside of code, neighborhood, you know, noise operating outside of hours, speeding, issue with construction vehicles not yielding, the damage our road is incurring, and now the compounding flooding. You asked me a couple of weeks ago when I came up here to speak to you, Mr. May, you assured me that there would be response. And I think that was almost verbatim your words, Miss, Miss Michelle, you will see some action today. You will see response. Not myself, my board, or any of the residents in my neighborhood have received any response from contractors, from the developer, from nothing. The response that I have gotten. I, I don't control the developer nor the contractor. Was there a response from staff? Yeah. Okay, that's all I can control. Horace and Kevin continue to assure okay. us that, that, that. And so, so for clarification, that's what I intended to say, uh, that there would be a response from staff. I, okay. I, I don't control private developers, nor do I control contractors. Just in reference to personal property damages, that's what we spoke about last time. So that's where I was. And I was told that we would ensure that either the developer or the contract, somebody would reach out to personal re residents that had property damage that was directly a result of the flooding that happened in the first four rain events, which is what brought me here the last time I spoke to you. Um, this is the response I got from two residents as of yesterday afternoon. That Thomas Henry, and there's video footage and still pictures of this, I believe Horace even mentioned it to you, left that development yesterday, drove by a home, backed up so that he could drive through her yard and over her Monarch Place sign. It's on film. It's not okay. My sign was stolen out of my yard three weeks ago. I don't have a fancy camera, so it wasn't on film, but I guarantee no one around me wants to steal my sign so they can put it next to the sign they already have. It's not okay what's happening in our community. It's not fair. We didn't ask for it. We spoke out about it. We brought evidence and specialists before a BOA. We spent a lot of money trying to appeal our county without really knowing how to do that, to try to bring all of the issues that have come to light before they happened. I know my time is up. Thank you very much. And, and, and Michelle, no need for you to respond. Let me be candid. I grew up in that neighborhood. My mother continues to live in that neighborhood. And I probably own more property in that neighborhood than most people. And so I, 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 I have a value uh, uh, to the quality of life of that neighborhood because many of the people that live there are, are people that I, I hung out at Brentwood Middle School and went to Woodham High School with. So I certainly understand it. Uh, I was one of the people and, and with Commissioner Berry that stood against the closing of Rawson Lane that adversely put traffic through Sarah, through Sunberg, through Confederate, that I knew that it would be a long-term effect. And so if people have watched my leadership, it's been that I've always been on the side of citizens. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the petition to the citizens uh, was not flooding uh, when we addressed this issue. It was traffic, it was congestion. And so I don't know what happened at BOA, even though you were encouraged to come down uh, to have conversation uh, with my four colleagues, which was probably ill-advised, uh, the flooding issue was never discussed. But as it becomes an issue today, it's my number one concern. It's my number one concern regardless of, of how many yard signs people put out, how, how many Facebook posts people put. Uh, my concern is for the citizens. I'm gonna continue to do that. Uh, I said today to the administrator uh, that we're gonna get there. Everything that I've said publicly uh, or privately, I've adhered to it. I said that my staff would be responsive and I would say the administrator has been responsive, the director of planning has been responsive, and I think the engineering has been responsive and we're gonna find a corrective uh, measure uh, to address the issues, uh, regardless of what happens. I can't change zoning in the middle of a development, but what I can do is make sure that people adhere uh, to the policies that are there. And so I appreciate it. Uh, 
and we become adversary, and, and if someone, and so for the record, and as we're on television, if someone advises you uh, that coming down uh, to be in a confrontational conversation uh, with District 3 yields great results, it doesn't. I'll continue to work with staff. I'll continue to work with you privately uh, on how we resolve this problem, and I'm going to stand with the citizens. So I appreciate your passion, and I, I feel your pain. I ride through that every single day of my life. I come down Monarch. My child goes to West Florida. My mother lives off Hancock. I go there every single day of my life. So I understand your pain, and we are addressing the issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Commissioner. Nikki Skipper. And um, we're having a, a small computer issue. Oh. Hi. So, go ahead. Thank you very much for, for allowing us all to have some time to speak to you face to face. I really appreciate it. My name is Nikki Skipper. I live in, at uh, 5916 Duchess Road, which is on the corner of Duchess and Monarch Lane. So I'm here to gripe about Monarch Lane, too. Not to be repetitive or anything, but Mr. May, when you said in reference to the BOA hearing, if that's true, in reference to the flooding, you broke my heart. I worked with Michelle Tyler on that appeal. I co-wrote it. I helped her get ready for it. I've been involved in this association since its, its formation. We talked about flooding. We don't lie. It is true. We talked about it. And, and please yield her time. Ma'am, I, I, I certainly, and, 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 and I know you and you know me, it's not my intention to break your heart. The BOA is an independent body that makes its own decisions. And so I, I tell you, when it was brought forth before us, pull the record, and it said traffic. I do understand that we have a flooding issue, and we're going to address that. And that's all I can do. So if we want to be in, if we want to go in attack mode, that's fine. And I'm willing to take those attacks because I take responsibility for any authority that I have. Uh, but if we're going to become adversaries, uh, then we'll be adversaries. Uh, if we're going to work together, then we're going to work together to correct the problem. If not, then, you know, the chips fall where they may, and that's why you have courts and lawyers and judges. And so I, I fully support that neighborhood because there are people that I have lifelong relationships with that live in that neighborhood who are my friends. And so you know I've always been supportive of that neighborhood, and I continue to be supportive of that neighborhood. And I do appreciate that. And I'm not looking to be adversarial. But we did discuss it. And yeah, let's please, let's work together. If there's anything we can do, it's really, I'm a bit removed from it by about a half a block. So it's, it's not my front yard. But seeing my friends' houses damaged, their driveways damaged, their gardens washed out, it, it's not fun. It's not fun. Um, and I would like to say that. Uh, the issue with the developer running over a sign, I saw it. I saw it. It's not OK. It's not OK. So please do what you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Henry? Good evening. I'm Thomas Henry, and I am the developer that they're speaking of. Uh, my company is Thomas Home Corporation. You know, um, you know, I understand how all this stuff works. Never quite been in a situation quite like this. And I've been doing this my entire life. Um, you know, you know, there's an emotional statement. I'm sure you all have heard of a lot of emotional statements from Mrs. Tyler, as you did tonight. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, what you just heard from Ms. Tyler is an absolute lie. An absolute lie. Now, if she has film of me doing that, she needs to show it. Um, and, and you will have witnesses that you know, work for you guys that can attest to that. Um, why on earth would I do something like that, number one? And you have heard a lot of things that are not the truth on this subdivision. A lot. I have been maliciously, you know, the, the newspaper article was malicious and untruthful. You know, there's no way that could have happened out there. There is absolutely no damage. I'm not talking about 
you know, 2%, 1%, there is zero damage that I have caused anybody in that neighborhood from anything that's happened. I mean, it hasn't. You know, it's so frustrating for me to read this stuff. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these big national guys. I'm a local guy. I'm trying to survive in this business with a bunch of guys who have pocketfuls of money that are national guys. I'm one of the last local guys left. I didn't take this project on to, to try to start trouble. It's just a project that came up. I grew up right down the road from the young. Lumen talks about where he lived. I lived in that neighborhood, walked by this property when I was a kid. I mean, I'm not trying to do anything other than be a business person. And an opportunity came along. I got sold a piece of property. I presented it to my engineer. My engineer took it to the county. We did nothing, nothing that out of the, out of the, you know, unexpected. We didn't ask for a favor. We did, I gave it, to, I gave it to, the, to, to the county. They went through the process. The engineer went through the process. We didn't do rezone. We didn't do nothing. Everything we've done is above board. We didn't ask for special circumstances for anything. We get our development order. We go to work. And the next thing I know, I'm like the worst guy that's ever, you know, stepped face in Pensacola. You know, th you know there, there's not only the citizens have rights. I'm a citizen, too. Everybody has rights to come up and say what they need to say. But you know, I have rights too. You know, I, didn't, I, didn't des I don't deserve this. I don't deserve what they've done. I don't deserve what they've said. And I don't deserve the lies that they're telling you guys that you're, they're making you guys believe. And now you're coming down on me every single day. She calls somebody every single day. M I mean, matter of fact, more than somebody. She calls a whole lot of people. And there's somebody out there every day. I mean, we are doing a Weird. I got every resource I got on that job trying to make it do everything I can. And like, like I said, there's been no damage. You take a picture of her driveway, she's clean washed away. It's the same picture if you took it five years ago. The same picture of her driveway. No difference. I can, it looks like a twin picture. I'm sorry. It looks like a twin picture. Five years ago, today. And, and you know what? If there was damage that, I mean, and I don't even know where it is because you can't see it, you know, there's probably for somebody else that was in her yard that wasn't me. And, you know, there, there's, it wasn't me. But there is no damage. It's, it's very disheartening for me to have to try to do business in this county. I'm not, I'm not trying to take advantage of somebody. I'm not trying to do anything that this county, you know, ordinances don't allow me to do. I didn't do anything special. I didn't ask for any favors, you know. I just took it to the county, my engineer did it, and, we, and it went to, and, and here's, here's the bottom line. At the end of the day, this is going to help them. This is going to help them. This ain't, about, this ain't about them wanting improvements or being hurt or something like that. This is going to help them because we're putting a pond in an area where there's never been a pond before, and we're taking the area that used to have water that just inundated everybody's yard around there, especially down that road. Water would come down that road. It did it before, way before I was even in a picture of this. And that's going to stop one day when we get done with this development. And it's going to help them. And we've already helped it. Right now, they would have a whole lot worse situations than what they got now. It's going to take us a while to develop it and get it done. It's going to get better. But all I ask you to do, and all I can ask you to do, is have an open mind and just, you know, don't necessarily look at what somebody says. Look at what the whole picture is. Have an open mind about me and about what we do, about who I am, as well as the people in here talking. You should have an open mind about everybody. But if somebody's not telling the truth, it's not fair to me to have to listen to that. And it's just, I mean, it just hasn't been the truth being told. Today I got accused of harassment from this lady. And I'll end it right here, and I'm sorry. I got accused of harassing this lady. She sent an email. I mean, some of you got it. I mean, how do I deal with that? This is what I've been having to deal with. She accused me of harassment. I don't even know the lady. So that's what I've got to deal with. And I apologize for taking too much time. But this is the only time I've come here. And so... You know, and my son is graduating tomorrow morning, and I can't be there because i got to deal with this. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for the speaker. Yes, sir. Mr. Sir, is it, did I understand correctly what you said, that you have, that all of the work that you've done in your build-out to date has been in accordance with the plans and in accordance with your DO? We are, we are developing that project according to the DO, yes. So all of the work that you've done has been in accordance with the engineered plans provided to you by your engineer? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know what the county's presented. To, the county hasn't said that, hey, you need to do, you know, we, we're doing exactly what the county does. They come out there, they want us to do something, we do it.
I, I appreciate that, um, and I appreciate. Now, that what are you, you claiming I did? I mean, you got obviously got a claim because you said I'm like the worst developer in the world. So you're asking I'm a question for something. Asking you a very specific question. Yeah. You got a set of engineered plans. Yes. To build off of, is it your statement today here that you have built everything that you've done is in accordance the with the county those plans? is monitoring us every day of what we do, and we're I mean um, we're 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 building the subdivision. That. Is that a yes or a no? <laughs> I'm not. You know, I'm not going to fall into your trap, Mr. Underhill. All right. Well, okay. Thank, thank you very You're much welcome. for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Jacqueline Lane. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm addressing you again tonight about the pollution in Verita Bay. You know, you granted international paper a tax exemption in 2007 for 10 years. They wouldn't have to pay taxes in Escambia County for 10 years. Well, what they did in those 10 years and beyond today is dump toxic waste into Perdita Bay. And today, Perdita Bay is a super fun site. And I am furious. Yes, oh yes. You can look at the data that we are, have presented to the um, Pensacola Perdita Bay Estuarine Program. And I have some here tonight if you'd like to see it. This is, this is heavy metals taken from my beach, from the muck in my beach in January. The Recra metals, these are eight metals that are toxic hazardous waste. Three of those metals on this site on, that was tested on my beach, arsenic, chromium, and bare, uh, lead, are twice the limit, twice the limit that EPA recommends. And this is the true of all, all the sediments on the Florida side of Perdita Bay. They are contaminated with heavy metals and dioxins. And this has been allowed, government has allowed this to continue. Jobs, I agree, are important. But to allow a large corporation to destroy our properties in our county, you have allowed a Superfund site to be created in Escambia County. Another one, yeah, right, another one. We have yet another a Superfund site in Escambia County. This was very stupid. Anyhow, <clears throat> I'm asking for, since we live on a super fun site on Perdita Bay, I am asking for reduced property taxes. Our property values will be nothing, nothing, because of, because of what government has allowed. Lack of enforcement by the environmental agencies, lack of testing by Escambia County and the state has allowed this to continue. This must stop. And, and not only do I want lower property taxes, I want Perdita Bay cleaned up. I want that stuff sucked out of the bottom. Really, I mean, it is, you, it is government's fault that this has occurred because we have been trying for 35 years to get this bay cleaned up and it has done nothing but get worse. And Commissioner Underhill, you can drink all the water you want, but you don't want to step in the bottom. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Lane, can I, can I ask you a question? Have you, have you gone up to IP and, and toured their they're polishing wetlands because because I have well I've seen them from the air I, f I have flown over them I've seen them from the air Mr. you know Commissioner Burgosh mm -hmm. the wetlands have taken out they have taken out nutrients they have they have removed nutrients but these things that they are discharging into the bay are not nutrients <laughs> they are hazardous waste well I, 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 I hear what you're saying and I read your articles when they come out and a couple of things, and since you're here, and I'd just like to ask you these questions because you know I, I was I started to get beat up. That's my district. Yeah. So and I, Commissioner Underhill's. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I reached out to IP, and I went and toured their facility, and I toured their polishing wetlands, and then I engaged our environmental department to do a follow-on sampling. And and Chips, I'm going to bring you up here. Please, please come forward, okay, um, because I was concerned, and everyone that I've spoken with. And the test results that I have seen is that the bay 
and the overall water quality in that bay is improving dramatically since 1999 and 2000 when our family owned property there on, um, uh, down off of uh, uh, off Lillian Highway, that out, out, out in that area, San Sebastian. So, um, Chips, would you mind speaking to that? Because you and I have talked about this multiple times, and you know I've spoken to the DEP people, and um, tell, tell me about, I mean, I'm, she's coming to the mic saying it's a super fun site. Obviously, that's got to be hyperbole. Will you, I mean, is there something going on that, that, I, that we need to know about? Well, Commissioner, as you mentioned, um, last year we did go out and do some uh, monitoring mm -hmm. uh, with the consultant for international paper as well as the University of West Florida uh, biologists. Uh, we split samples, uh, sent them to two different labs, you know, just to verify the, the water quality parameters that were being monitored. Um, that data from the water quality monitoring we did uh, did, did not show any, any violations. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Lane's talking about the sediment. Uh, we, we did not do any sediment sampling. Mm -hmm. um, sediment uh, pollutants typically can be there 30, 40, 50 years, you know, unlike water quality that changes by the minute. Sure. Uh, and we, also, we all know the history of Champion uh, before sure. international paper. Uh, there, there was a, a lot of pollution going into Perdido Bay, and it would not surprise me at all that there's some legacy pollutants uh, in the sediment. And, but I mean, in terms of the water quality, would you and I had the conversation? Would you, would it be your professional opinion that that water is improving over time? D definitely. Uh, you know, I've, kn I've known Jackie for 30 years. We used to teach biology together at, at Pensacola State College many years ago. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, when, when I first started working with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, 30 years ago, uh, there were serious water quality issues uh, with Champion at the time, uh, but it has improved, yes. And uh, you know, I, I've also read in, in your articles that you've written that you know, there's problems with the, with the marine life, and I was told there I wouldn't find blue crabs. I actually went to our property on Perdido Bay and took chicken legs on strings, and blue crabs were there. Blue crabs, I mullet. Crabs every now and then. Yeah, so I mean, I, I we you know we have limited control of what IP does. I mean, obviously we've given them e-dates or you know economic development incentives to create jobs, and um, I would say they're trying to make things better. They're polishing wetlands, um, have reduced the effluent that used to go into Eleven Mile Creek, and now they go through their 1,200 acres of wetlands. It's a very impressive site. If you've never had the opportunity to go there, you should go there and see it. I mean, you're obviously a professional, but so is Chips. And you know he, he tells me the water pro quality is improving. It's much better since 1999. Um, I can't go in a time machine and fix things that happened 30 years ago, but I, I can't punish people who are trying to fix it and maintain jobs, good jobs for people in Escambia County. I appreciate you coming. Well, uh, the legacy pollution that you talked about is probably buried under several feet of what they're putting out. They're putting out International paper puts out every day, every day into Burdita Bay, they're allowed to put out 8,000 to 16,000 pounds of solids. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, you could cover up, you could fill Burdita Bay with that. And we just tested, we just got this testing done. Uh, actually, there was even more recent testing, I haven't gotten the results back. But this, they're only taking a small, a small little uh, surface sample. And this is the, where the toxic stuff occurs, is right in the surface samples. It's not legacy pollution. This, has been, this is current pollution. International paper doesn't know what's in that 8,000 to 16,000 pounds of solids they dump. I mean, I just took, I just took them. It, I had the environmental supervisor um, de deposition. And I asked her, what is in that stuff? Oh, they don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's ridiculous. We now live, well, the bay is now a Superfund site. Whether, whether it was 50 years ago or 20 years ago, it is currently a Superfund site. And I, you know what? I want my property taxes reduced. Just like they got theirs reduced, I want mine reduced. We live on a Superfund site. I don't want to have to pay property tax. I, it's a beautiful bay. Chips, would you speak to what a Superfund site is? I mean, I, look, I'm not an environmental 
scientist, but I know that has a specific designation. It certainly has a certain um, connotation to it. So, it, I mean, it, what she is saying, that's her opinion, correct? Correct. It is not a Superfund site, the correct? Su Superfund site has to be designated by correct. the U.S. Well, Environmental thank Protection. Thank you. So that's your opinion. But, that's my opinion. I, but Perdido Bay is not a Superfund site. I'm it's going. not a Superfund site. No. Thank you. And we will thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, will, I don't want to take up too much of the people's time during this, but I have to say, I mean, uh, 20 years ago when I moved to Escambia County, I read every single word that Friends of Perdido Bay put together. Um, and, uh, and certainly there were some, uh, the, the way that we were handling IP back then was, was horrible. Uh, the uh, agreement that ECUA, IP, and, uh, and this board put together, a previous board put together um, for that uh, wetlands is absolutely phenomenal science, and it absolutely works. Um, knowing full well everything that has been written about Perdido Bay, uh, I chose to raise my children in Perdido Bay. Um, uh, the redfish, the speckled trout, and the flounder, and the blue crabs from Perdido Bay go on my table at least once a week. Um, so if we were, if it was a, uh, a toxic, uh, if, the, if the, the benthic environment there was, was toxic, those blue crab would be as well. Um, it's just not, it's just not. My children um, have the luxury of being in the water all the time, much more so than, uh, than most of our, our citizens. Um, before living on Perdido, or on, on Perdido Key, I lived at the end of Casica Street at the south end of Perdido Bay. Extremely familiar with that water, extremely familiar with the, with the realities of Perdido Bay. I chose to raise my children there. I chose to raise three uh, years worth of uh, Pac 626 Weebelos uh, who had their den meetings at our, uh, at our house and learned to fish in our backyard um, and then eat the food that they brought out of the, uh, see there by the, <laughs> uh, and ate the food that they caught out of the bay. So, um, you know, no, there, there's, it, my grandchildren will grow up in that water. Um, there are more crabs today. There are more, uh, the entire biomass of Perdido Bay is greater today than it was 20 years ago, greater today than it was 10 years ago, greater than it was five years ago. Dolphins are routinely found swimming even in the upper bay, um, and that simply wasn't the case 20 years ago. So do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. Um, is the human condition uh, toxic to the environment? Yes, it is. Uh, have we done phenomenal things in Perdido Bay over the last 20 years? Absolutely. And the next 20 years will be even better. Great. Thank you. DeWitt Stallworth. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is DeWitt Stallworth. I have, been, I have worked at the Scammon County Air Transit for two, 22 years. Previous, before I was there, I was at Community Transportation, and before that, I was in the United States, United States Marine Corps, where I served in Vietnam 50 years ago. The reason why I'm here to speak out about ECAT, because things have got to be where they just are deplorable. The first thing I'd like to say is uh, uniform. These pants that you see I have on here, I have two pair of pants, two. I got one in the washing machine I'm gonna have to go home and wash. And this pair that I have on, I a supervisor those. I wore jeans two for last Thursday and Friday. I wore, cause I didn't have no pants clean. A supervisor come up to me and asked, told me that if I wore any more jeans that I would be disciplined, either rolled up, sent home, or, or just sit home. So, I, so she said that I could go buy something if I wanted to, but I told her I was not going to go spend my own money to buy no uniform when we have a CBA that where the county is supposed to provide uniform for us. But, you know, we have a, they have a dispatch around here just hired. She's walking around with her skirts constantly pushed, pulled down. Put it down, just like she's going to a party on Pensacola Beach or somewhere. I'm just telling the truth. I don't have no reason to tell no lie. And I'm a taxpayer. I see Mr. McGarvey. I'm a taxpayer just like anybody, and I done paid a lot of taxes in this community. I think Mr. May know what I'm talking about. I have paid a lot of taxes. And my salary, I don't take a salary for me, Kept My salary goes to help senior citizens that can't buy blood pressure medication, that can't buy 
different kind of medical. My mother died of kidney failure because I have other investments, and Bishop may know what I'm talking about. And the second thing I want to say is uh, we had a had a uh, uh, an employee that worked that's been on the job 25 years and got COVID and was released from the job for no guess because she was sick. She got released. She come back. Then they tell her that she only she can come back if she got to reapply. That's that's wrong for someone. We dealing with this pandemic, and I don't know what the management, our the leadership, and out up there at ECAT is doing. You know, because it's just absolutely wrong. No raise. Tried Mr. Mike Lowry, because he was speaking up for the workers, and he was the one that was causing us to have the PPP, the sneeze shield, and all that. It's, it's something needs to be done. You need to start all over again. Because we had this problem with First Transit. Violio, then we had the problem with First Transit. Now this problem is, still, is coming back again, coming back again. And you got a union contract. We haven't had a union contract. You got this high paid lawyer, whoever is Mike Manimal. He comes up here from Tallahassee, I guess, for one day. But that's the, that's the taxpayer's money that we spend it. Just for him to come up here in one day. It's something needs to be done. Cause Mike Lowry and Miss Gilly and all of them, Miss Ellis, they can all sit down. We can get this contract worked out in a few days, and that'll be it. And I know we would, we would love to do that. So I think there's. Yeah, why pay a lawyer all this money to come up here for nothing? So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm not going to sit here anymore and say people didn't get a raise when we had a meeting today and say that people were off a three percent and three percent for two years. That would be six percent. That's either true or false. I mean, the reality of it, a raise was offered. Just, just right, Madam Administrator. Yes, sir. A raise. Yes, sir. When when we offered an MOU in twenty for the twenty twenty budget, it was a three percent raise. Yes, sir. And that was twenty. Twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. But but it would have you would have fall of twenty nineteen. Fall of twenty nineteen. Yes. So by fall of twenty twenty one. It, you would have maintained it from it the previous it. year. But there yeah. was a 3% raise. Yes, sir. An MOU, a memorandum of understanding, and it was never signed by the union. Okay. And um, that, I mean, we have we have numerous records that will demonstrate that along with videos and um, documentation. I mean, okay. that, 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 I mean all, of our, all. all of our meetings are out there on the all YouTube, right. and, I mean, they're all available right. for anyone right. to see. I mean, we did absolutely, as a matter of fact, we provided it to all the unions, and every union signed it, with the exception of the um, ATU for ECAP. And to win, I'm not in any negotiations. I don't get that and, and have tremendous amount of respect for you and, 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 and Mike. And, and, but as I sit there, I'm not going to let Willie Carter go home believing that there was not a raise. Now, I mean, providing more than two uniforms and all that, it needs to be equity, equitable. If they're providing uniforms for corrections, they better be providing them for ECAT. I mean, and so I don't know exactly what that policy is, but I'll look into that. Uh, but I've been advised and told, and, and Madam Administrator just said that there was a 3% raise, which was no different from any other employee at Escambia County. Nobody else got more than 3%, correct? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir. I was in that meeting, Commissioner May. I remember that being a unanimous support for that 3% raise for all the unions to include the ATU. Uh, Jerry Bell. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm acting as a past employee of 17 years at ECAT, not only as a bus operator, but as a supervisor, also the vice president of the union. I get calls almost daily. Ms. Bell, can you come help us out? What can you do? The last call I got was about uniforms. So I clean up my garage and I have a whole bunch of uniforms, most of which I purchased myself. I'm gonna donate them to my former peers and employees. It's a shame when I see my friends and coworkers, the uniforms that they're wearing, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And then to hear that my president, Mike Laurie, was terminated while trying to protect the employees, because you had no PPE. And I know Lumen May himself came down there to address the situation, because drivers were calling me. 
we have no PPE. And then my best friend end up with COVID? And you do what? Involuntary separation? What does that mean? You terminated her, knowing that there was other options you could have used. I cannot understand what is going on. And everybody came up here all over the county, all of your districts have nothing but complaints. These people worked their behinds off the whole time the pandemic was going on, and nobody gave them an extra penny. In fact, another union offered some shields for your buses, and they drove long distance to pick them up. One of our unions, ATU. So I don't know what you got against ATU, but I can tell you for 17 years that I worked there, there wouldn't have been a whole lot of stuff if ATU didn't speak up. So all of you that are sitting there have a problem with ATU, I think you need to come together and work with them because these are the people that transport your people, your constituents that have to vote for you. Do you think that's correct? That you're walking over these people like this? I am terribly upset and I will come down here every time. And as far as the management goes and the county goes, you guys are making your money. You guys are being protected. What about these people? My friend is walking around with oxygen. She's younger than I am. Matter of fact, when she got sick, I was the one that went and rescued her from her home. Because nobody else did. And she laid in that hospital. And you want to terminate her and give her nothing for 26 years? By the way, can be proven she has the most overtime. Because every time somebody's out, she's there to pick up the slack, like I used to do. Something has to be done. Commissioners, please do something. You cannot let these people be treated. And I know you got $10.2 million. You didn't even give them a 50 cent raise, let alone a $500 bonus. What did you do? Everybody happy? These people are not happy. They're not happy. So what are you going to do? I'm asking you, Commissioner, woman made of most of the people in your district, Underhill, Bagosh, Bender, and you know Stephen Barry, I'm after you too. <laughs> Not in a negative way, don't take it that way. But we need to do something. These people need to be protected, they need to be taken care of. And we, by the way, there's been a lot of COVID in Pensacola. So what are you gonna do? Do you think it was fair that you terminate somebody that's trying to help the employees? Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Ms. Bell. You, Mr. Chairman, and I really don't yes. respond because- Yep, please hold we, the applause. We, yep, and obviously there's time. Madam Administrator, will you please respond because there, there's no way in good conscience I would sit at a dais and someone gets terminated due to COVID. And mm -hmm. I know that there are personnel issues that we can't talk about, um, but for the record, I need to know, is that true or false? Mm -hmm the individual was not terminated for COVID. Okay. Involuntary separation means what? Same I'm Diane Harrison, 1716 Martin Luther King Drive. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of my sister, Gwendolyn McCormick, who works for ECAT. And if the you one just with the don't mind speaking tank. a little bit, bit more into the microphone is, is to your left. Yes, ma'am, right, right there. Right here? Yes, ma'am, okay. thank you. All right. I'm very concerned because she has been terminated from her job the job that she's worked on for many, many years, very dedicated, and is this what she gets? Because she had COVID, and look, not only did she have it from getting it from her job, I had it too. My family had it. So I'm very concerned about the policies, procedures, the rules and regulations at ECAT. What do they do? when one of their workers can get it, uh, come in contact with COVID. Now, what I did, I talked to Tanya Ellis. I called her and I talked to her. 
Because I want to know how you're protecting your workers. If you have a person who has COVID, so you don't tell the rest of the workers, you don't go get them tested to make sure that they are safe. What is going on here? That's how this is being transferred and other people are getting infected. And I'm highly upset over that because I went through it. My son went through it. My nephews, all of my nephews, my nieces, 13 of us because of ECAT. She's the one that got it, that's still suffering from it, and I am myself. So I asked her, I wanted to know, what do you, what do, you do when your employee, employees are infected? She told me, she said, well, we fog the buses nightly, temperature and mass daily, no mass testing. When, they, when it first happened, they did the mass testing. So when they did that, that meant that the workers had to be quarantined for so many days. You all know what the drill is on that. So by them quarantining them, that means that 38 workers were out. She said 38 workers was out, and we needed those people on the bus. I said, oh, I so you're telling me that you're more concerned about having the people on the bus driving than you are about the safety and the health of your employee. No, 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 I didn't say that. I said, but you implied that. And that's why I'm here. I am upset over this, and something needs to be done about how you uh, protect those employees. When COVID was raging, when it first started, what they did, they wanted the people to come in the back of the bus. They didn't have the shields up there for the workers. Why didn't they do something to protect the workers? In the first place, they should have shut all the buses down. They could have had people that were working to actually call in to get a schedule going where they can pick people up and do something else rather than putting these people at risk. And a number of people at ECAT have suffered with COVID. Thank and you. I'm still upset Thank you, about Mr. it because I still have after effects. So hopefully you all will put something in place to protect these workers and take care of my sister. Letting her go is not a means of taking care of her. And thank you for listening. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Michael Lowry. Good evening, commissioners. Before you start my clock, can I ask a question? No, sir. Mr. Chairman? No, sir. Time, we're, we're running a little behind, so. I well, I was just going to ask. There was something that was brought up. I'd like to. Add. I wasn't going to speak on it, but I'd like to add it to it. Your, your time's calling, sir. I appreciate it. A lot of people got a lot of time today. I, I'd like to start with the what Mr. May, uh, Commissioner May, brought up about wages for the employees. Labor negotiations, yes, Commissioner Underhill. Uh, all the unions were offered the raise of three percent in in that physical year. The difference with our union contract and the other union contracts, we accepted the 3%. The issue is we have what's called a wage progression. That's very important for you to think. The other union contracts do not have what's called a wage progression. All we said was apply it to the steps of that wage progression. They said, no, we're gonna give it to the existing employees only. That right there, causes more layers to the progression without really negotiating. That's not fair. We said just apply it to the wage progression. Some will not understand this, and that's frustrating, unless you're involved with those negotiations. We put, we so, put about, so Mike, but Mike, can you stop, I'm gonna give you, you time my just clock, because please? I'm gonna ask you a question. Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to the chairman, why wouldn't we allow for the existing employees to go ahead and accept the 3% and renegotiate for incoming employees. Why would we not give those employees that have been there the 3%? I, I understand exactly where you're going, but there are people, there's Willie Carter, who's my neighbor and my friend, uh, uh, who didn't get his 3%, who, who needed it. And he's suffering 
uh, because of other people that are coming in. And so, I mean, I'm tired of closed door meetings. I'm tired of talking about that. I'm going to lay it out where, where, where union members and everybody can talk about it. Why wouldn't that have made sense? I, I mean, and I understand where you're going in your negotiation. I'm not a union guy. Right. Uh, but it didn't make sense to me the way it's been explained to me by council, uh, by administration, why these people wouldn't get their 3%. So I hope you're not going to start the clock. No, I want to answer no. this question. No, no, no. I, I've spent hours okay. of my life Thank dealing you. with it, so I'll, so I'll, 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 I'll spend another minute to hear it. For, First Commissioner, compared to that one proposal from the county, the union has given many proposals countering that. To answer your question, the concern then becomes, as others move through the progression, will they just end up, will they ever reach the top pay? And the answer is no, they will never catch the other individuals that are at the top. That then changes the scope of the progression. So I, I would ask, we should just put the negotiations to the side and the administrator, Ms. Ellis, the union, we should focus on the wage increase only for absolutely, that physical year. Ab absolutely. You go back to that year, you give the people the 3%, and then you come back and negotiate everything else. You know, I mean, so, and, and I, I, I agree. Go in there and negotiate with Administrator Gilly and Mike, the rich lawyer from Tallahassee, I mean, and Christian, and negotiate that, give the people their 3%, negotiate what's best for the people moving forward, unless there's something you tell me why we shouldn't. I, I know that it, when I look at inflation and the increases, in, in the fall of 2019, they could have had 3%. By inflation, it probably would be 7% at this time, and it... it it bothers me that they don't get the three percent oh, in, in me. anticipation of, of somebody else that's going to be hired. I'm happy that somebody else that gets hired. But I'll tell you who I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about Carolyn. I'm concerned about Miss Stanberry. I'm, I'm concerned about Willie Carter. I'm concerned about the people, um, Mike Lauer, the people that are working there now. And I am livid, livid that the people didn't get their increase. And so I want to figure out how do we get the people that drive the buses, that represent the people, give them the money that they deserve, and then we'll figure this other stuff out in negotiations. But that's not a carrot because, quite frankly, sometimes I'm the long ranger, and I hear, like Tonto out here by myself. It's not going to work. It's, it, give the people their money, and then let's negotiate everything else. One in hand beats two in the bushes, Mike. So we got to take it, the one in the hand and then move forward. Okay, if I will agree with that. If you agree, that the wage progression will be readjusted accordingly. Because I can't agree with You know, I can't agree with that, Come on now. I, I'm just trying to tell you, Commissioner. I can agree that I'll support it, but you know, I, I, I'm, one of, I, I'm one of five. I can't agree to that. What I can agree to is what I've agreed to since Steve and I have been on this board, that I have been an, an adamant advocate supporter of mass transportation and equity and compensation. And you know, and that's what I want to happen. I'm tired of going and, well, I'm, listen, just take the money we paid in lawyer fees and then give it to the bus drivers. I am sick of the bickering and not being able to get the people the money. And so I don't even want to have this conversation in a public dialogue. So what I'm saying is I'm stating publicly my position. Give the people their 3%, go back and negotiate the progression stuff, but go ahead and let's get these drivers their money. Let, I mean, they deserve it. I'm available tomorrow. I'm ready to talk. I've been available most days, okay? I'm ready. I've been ready. So to speak on the other things, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and I apologize for taking your time. No, I understand. I understand. I wanted to speak on two things. One is, you know, I'm going to save the best for last, okay? But I wanted to speak about Ms. McCormick. There is an opportunity for us to reach a settlement in her predicament. There is an opportunity. You could set a non-precedenting setting situation with the union because she's not an employee that abused leave. Her leave was absorbed because of COVID. If she was an abuser of leave, you wouldn't hear me talking about this. This is a pandemic. That individual, we should sit down and set some parameters that if she is able to come back and she's able to pass a DOT physical, which is what she's striving for, and she's trying, commissioners, she's trying, she's getting better every day, that she will be recognized for those 25 years and she can finish out and get that state retirement, which she's working for. 
She has to reach eight years to be vested. She only got halfway. We should reach a settlement. The last thing I want to say is I want to thank, I want to thank Ms. Ellis, Mr. Kimbrell, and even Mr. Griffin today. They took time out today and worked and spoke to myself, my ATU International Executive Vice President who's here in the audience. Communication is the key. Sitting in a room, we can agree to disagree, but I'll say this, and I'll, fi I'll finish up. But until you sit across from each other and you talk, you will find ways to find and reach an agreement. But it takes sitting in the room together. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mike, yes, Mike you represent more than just ECAT. And in, is there a disparity in, in uniform distribution among uh, different departments? Uh, uh, the you, uniform. You just had two people come down. I mean, the poor DeWitt here has two pair of pants and one's in a coin loan laundry somewhere. <laughs> you don't have the time to talk about the uniform situation, but I will say this. No, it's just yes I will no. say this. I, is there a disparity? It's not a long conversation. I will say yes this. Or no. Mr. Kimbrough and I and Miss Ellis are getting to the end of this. We just we have a plan, and it will be it will be fixed for the employees. They're frustrated. That's why you hear them speaking about it. Well, okay. If, if there, and, and Mike, for the future, because there's not been a better champion for ECAT than Lumen May in, in, in the history of Escambia County. Uh, there's no sense in inciting if there is a point of negotiation where there's going to be a resolution. And so if there is a disparity in, their, in the equities that are happening, then Lumen May is going to be the first person to grab the mic and, 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 and raise hell. But if it's not proven disparity, then people can't make massive statements that are not factual. And so it is. If, if corrections is getting 10 uniforms, and I'm looking at correction officers, and ECAT's getting two, that's a disparity. If, if they're getting two and they're getting two, then that's equality. Uh, and so if, if, there, if, if we're in negotiation and we're saying that we're finding resolution, there's no sense to come here on, on a Thursday uh, uh, and, and, and uh, delay a meeting about something that there's a resolution that's being resolved that the conversation has no real benefit for the public. And so their uniform allowance has been held up for two years. And it's a process that probably Miss Gilly could speak to better than me. And that's, well, that's what it's well, been. It's been two well, years, but, if they, but if they're not getting uniform. But I will. I, I got to give credit when credit's due. I, I see uh, Mr. Kimbrough working very hard to put in place a program that will get uniforms to the employees fast. So I will give well, credit. That's a better conversation for, for employees to come down and say Mr. Kimbrough is doing a great job and he's doing exactly what he can do rather than come down and make accusations. Because at the end of the day, I accept the responsibility of authority, but I will not stand and, and advocate for an organization that comes down and points fingers and then there's a resolution that's on the table that's equitable and fair, that's unfair. That's unfair to the staff, and it's unfair to the commission. Well, they so, haven't had their uniforms for two years. Well, well, well let's right. say that. You know, that's correct. You know, two years. Let's say that. Say, well, now that's unfair. If they hadn't had them for two years, and everybody else has had them. Then that's not fair. And then that's what we say. We don't say that there's a that's resolution it. on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm not one of your regular speakers, but I'm going to say what I can say. My name is Gwendolyn McCormick. I live at 1011 Edison Drive. I was employed ECAT until they terminated me. They said it was involuntary separation. And I was out, well, we're still out with the COVID. <clears throat> and I want to know why they had to do this to me at this critical time in my life. I want to know if anything happened to your family like this, what would you have done? And we need to resolve this incident. They gave me a couple of options, but they say if I'm able to come back, that I will have to start at the bottom of the board. And we have had people that leave, they go to other jobs and come back, and they put them back, back in their regular position. But why do I have to start at the bottom? That's what I want to know. 
And I thank my coworkers for speaking for me. They mostly, you know, put it in a nutshell of what's going on. And thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, sir. Madam Administrator Tanya, uh, and Ms. Gwendolyn, and thank you. First, let me just say, public, thank you for your service. I know the many years that you've driven that bus, and you've been more than a driver. You've been a counselor. You've been a friend. So I pre and you don't need to keep standing, Ms. Gwendolyn. I know you're on oxygen, so it, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to ask the Madam Administrator. Uh, I, I know that it's certainly out of line, and, and I will not fall out of protocol uh, with my statutory responsibilities. But if there can be an engagement in, in, in talking with, with Gwendolyn, I would appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that she had COVID, and I do know many of her family members, and I've had family members, and we've had friends that have also suffered, and uh, we have gone through a pandemic. And if there's a resolution, uh, Ms. Gwendolyn, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be the first person that's being your biggest cheerleader to find some resolution. Uh, when you give 20, 30 years to an organization, uh, I think uh, you deserve some type of uh, sympathy. Uh, uh, I think you deserve some type of uh, uh, help. And so uh, I'm asking the administrator, would you please work with them uh, yes, sir. to uh, work with Ms. Gwendolyn? Thanks, Ms. Gwendolyn, and you know you're in my prayers. So. Thank you. Willie Carter. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Willie Carter. My home address is 1207 West Gregory. I want to try to skip, uh, speak about two different events if I can. First of all, I've been knowing Gwen for years and years when she worked at a place called 7-Eleven. That's just how long I've been knowing her. And when she came to ECAT, she did what she's supposed to do. She worked all the time and she just stuck her hand up or whatever it took. They called her on the phone in the middle of the night. She would be there the next morning. I can remember the day that she got real sick. She came in there in the driver room and she said, I don't feel that well. And I told Gwen, I said, you need to go home. She did not go home. She went out there and drove a bus. That take a lot of guts for anybody to do. And she did what she's supposed to do at all times. And I, I like for us to give her a job back where she's supposed to be, a seniority or whatever. It's not stepping on anybody's feet. It's more than right when a person gets sick, especially with the virus going around during that particular time. She needs to get back to work. I can tell, excuse me, the way she was talking then, she ready to come back to work. So I'm going to stop there. Now I'm going to the second topic. Mike Lowry is a fearful leader. He put his job on the line and he lost his job. And he's still doing work for the people. And that's what we're looking for in any man that's in charge. And he did exactly what he's supposed to do. But I must say, we got to stick together, not only as a union, but as a body of people. We don't need to be arguing among ourselves. We all got to work every day and do what we have to do to survive. And we don't need to sit there and talk about each other behind the back. If you got something to say to someone, say it. Be proud of yourself. You know, life goes a long way, you know. So all I got to say is let's keep on doing what we're doing tonight. This is a very good meeting, and everybody is putting their, what they would call their nickel worth in, and they are. Let's don't leave here with no grudges because God is watching all of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, Jerome Bess. Good afternoon. I was just sitting back there just absorbing everything that was going on and hmm, be honest with you, I don't feel good. And the reason why, because everything that has transpired just makes me feel sad. 
Mainly because the Bible says that love is what love does. So the opposite of that is hate. So uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is I, I'm concerned about my coworker, Gwen. Hmm. I understand that there's policies and this and that and that and this, but there are other options. I believe that you guys have the power to make policies and recommendations and other things to change whatever the rules and regulations are. I believe you, you guys have the policy. And we're dealing with something that has probably never happened or shall I say, haven't happened, but once every 100 years or whatever the case may be, a pandemic. So there should be some other type of uh, things put in place, whatever the case may be, to save our, my coworker because she did this because she came to work. She did it because she loved the work and I don't think we should have just allowed the things that has transpired as we did. It seemed like we should have came up with a plan B way better. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we come to work and we put our lives on the line. When this thing first started, we came to work. And they didn't have no kind of safety things there for, but we still came. And I mean, we came and we came and they, and they did a little bit, but it really wasn't enough. Trust me, it wasn't enough. Even after some of us contacted the virus, we still came. So I understand that you guys have policies and procedures and all that, that's fine. But don't look at us as a policy and, 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 and just look, look at it as, as, as a person. I just don't understand the reason why we just so much in conflict with each other. And if we just show a little love towards each other, things would be a lot better. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Best. Kevin Wade. Hey, man's right, isn't it? Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. I wanted to come and celebrate a little today, but um, having a COVID denying administrator and her bimbo squad prancing around here for the last year, maskless. Almost every meeting, introducing people and giving out the proclamations, maskless, to people who came to celebrate with their daughters, with their sons, who wore their masks. Couldn't social distance. We have our own Scambia County Sharon Stone. How many people she gets sick? And how many people, what, what was that bit about throw another one on the fire? or bonfires, right, over India. And what are we? We are a Second Amendment sanctuary city. And our bus drivers end up being treated pretty horribly, quite often by citizens. And yeah, some of those citizens may have some problems. But the shenanigans of what's happened to Miss Gwendolyn no, stop it, again. Like, no, uh, I remember the talk over the shields. That was gonna be too expensive. Um, that was just rolling into the COVID times too. And having this COVID denying parts of the administration just really, really say some terrible things about this county. And several of you, I really respect. I really, really do. I want to talk about Pale Moon Drive and the people that are dealing with flooding in their area. Uh, the empty chair right now, he's gone. Pale Moon Drive, that was his ex-business partners. 
Then we got Deer Run. Oh, whoops. Yeah, we have developers going ahead and rolling on with their plan. Well, if your plan includes stormwater management, wouldn't you start with stormwater management and not go ahead and let your stormwater run through the neighborhood that your new tenants will have to drive through for the entire period that they're living there? But that makes too much sense. And I really hope that this county does the right thing to Miss Gwendolyn. Because going ahead and sending a, we're sorry, you've used up all your leave to the wrong address. To the wrong address. Huh? How, how does that happen? And were there phone calls? No, no. And Thank Joy you, Jones gutting, gutting her department and coming up here today and blaming the stormwater on sod that the neighbors put in their swales. Melissa Pino? Thank you, Chairman Bender. I'm Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Boblets. I, like Kevin, was really excited to come down here and say whoop whoop, uh, beach access. I was gonna suggest to the commission that we keep the momentum going down in Perdido Key because it's a freaking mess down there and you can't park and the businesses could have so much more revenue if the commission actually took Perdido Key planning away from Doug the rest of the time he was commissioner, we could really start overturning some of the bad stuff and that was what I really wanted to focus on. I'll say more about that at a later time. This county is falling apart. Look at this public forum tonight. Is there anything that's working in this county? Is there anybody that's happy? But we did see what works is for somebody like Thomas Henry to stand up and boo hoo about the destruction that he's wrought that is, oh, oh, and lie, lying to you guys works really well. Just standing here and bold face lying. See it time and again. This is nothing different than what Margaret Hostetter was fighting back in, in Deer Run. It was nothing different than when they tried to pretend like Fran Ogden was crazy down on Pale Moon Drive because Doug Underhill's ex-business partner came in there, rolled in with no commencement, no stormwater plan. Why do we keep pretending we're seeing all these patterns for the first time and it's anomaly every time that it happens? I think every commissioner that I communicate with or to from time to time has said that I have said of all of it, the most atrocious thing that's going on is what's happening at ECAT. You're not seeing the first instances of this. You are seeing the point where staff frustration is boiling over and they simply can't take it anymore. And it's not just ECAT, it's just that the union busting that's going on there has, has created the worst of what's happening, but Miss Gilly has been gutting veteran staff all over the county, man. If you're coming up on your 25 or your 30, you better watch it. You got some institutional knowledge, you've got a little bit of ethical, ethical backbone, forget about it. And I don't understand how long you commissioners are going to sit there and let this county fall apart under this administration. Continual lying, continual fabrication, telling you guys that there was PPE on those buses back when there wasn't, saying that they were getting disinfected and rolling out a couple of them and going through a little dog and pony show for WEAR while never even made it a policy for passengers to have to have a mask on when they got on that bus. And, 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 and Ms. Gwendolyn is not the first person that has been fired at this county for the audacity of coming down with COVID during a pandemic. There are no policies. She just makes it up as she goes along every single time. You guys gotta fix it. You're the, you're the only ones who can, please. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Roger Coleman. Good evening. 
Give me an I have to listen to everybody, and I don't even think I want to speak, but I am. <laughs> Um, I am the uh, program manager at Volunteers of America. We house homeless veterans with behavioral health care. I am here representing Shirley Stone from the uh, Shepherd's Place Foundation. Uh, she is out of town. She asked me to come in and talk to the county about land for tiny homes for the homeless people and for veterans. And she is looking for the county to donate a parcel of land. She have a contractor. She have the funding. She just needs the land. And I am asking the county if they will consider donating land to help find places for the veterans. And these tiny homes are a shoe-in for them. We have an uh, epidemic, not only with the regular veterans, um, but also with homeless people, period. And Pensacola is getting an influx. We count every year, and there's more and more coming to Pensacola because they say there's benefits but there are no benefits for them. We deal with veterans, we deal with homeless people. Uh, there's a problem and we need your help to solve it. We have a solution and we're asking you to help us solve that. We're looking for some land to build some homes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, that's our final speaker for the night. Uh, we'll uh, reconvene at uh, 610. <laughs>